Buenos tardes. Buenos tardes. Good afternoon. Voy a hacer mi discurso hoy, uh, mi discurso corto en inglés, porque tenemos aquí mucha gente que tiene una disabilidad lingüística que hablan únicamente inglés. Entonces, lo siento mucho. Um, my job is to help ignite uh, this group. Um, and I'm supposed, to be, um, I'm supposed to be talking about things that could help achieve the triple aim. Everybody here knows what the triple aim is? Lower per capita costs, better health, better patient experience. So I'm um, pretty traditionally trained in pretty traditional institutions and pretty traditional methods, and yet I'd like to talk about, I think, an untraditional contributor to the achievement of the triple aim. I'm not going to suggest that it is the way to do it. I long ago gave up belief in silver bullets and magic beans, but I think it can play a part. And I'd like to submit to you part of my journey of how I've come to believe more and more in self-care, or what one might better term, perhaps, radical co-creation of health with patients. Let's start with health care reform. How big a deal is health care reform? Well, in the words of the Vice President, it's a big fucking deal. <laughs> Not my words, mind you, the Vice President's words. But how big a deal it is actually depends a fair amount on where you live at the moment. And depending on where you live, you are somewhere in this kind of Obamacare two by two. The question is, has your state decided to expand Medicaid? And is your state going to establish a state exchange? Now, the great state of North Dakota has said, yes, they're going to expand Medicaid, but they won't have an exchange. The great state of Utah is exactly the opposite. Two of the four states with the largest number of uninsured people have said not just no, but hell no to both Medicaid expansion and the creation of an exchange. And of course, the land of 10,000 lakes is in the yes and yes column. Remember that the way in which people get access to health care under Obamacare is either that they are in a new expanded Medicaid program or they are now covered by private insurance, which they purchase through an exchange, state or federal, with federal subsidies. And in either case, they now have more money to spend on health care. And as you might expect, they will spend more money on health care. That is the point of giving people insurance. And look in the right corner here, more visit visiting hospitals under Obamacare. More are also visiting emergency rooms. Don't believe the old canard that the uninsured go to the ER more than the insured. They go less, for the same reason they go every place else in healthcare, because they have less money. But they also go to the doctors more, which has led to the impending so-called physician shortage. And everywhere now one is reading about the, the uh, growing lines and different approaches to creating solutions to the physician shortage. I actually don't believe there is a physician shortage, and that's what I want to try to share with you. So two years ago, I was chair of a committee, I was privileged to chair a committee, a study committee of the Institute of Medicine, which released a report called Best Care at Lower Cost. And in many ways, we were trying to update the IOM's view since the To Air is Human uh, report. And one of the things that we focused on was the ubiquitous complexity in American medicine, which is one of the side effects and consequences of American medicine's great successes. The fact that we have so many diagnostic factors in play with many, many more on the way with the advent of functional genetics, gene expression profiles, proteomics, and other omics on the way, has led to an incredibly complex system. And we tried to help providers understand that the reason they need to practice differently from the way they did 20 years ago is not that they're not smart, not that they don't care, not that they made horrible mistakes, but simply that the world is different. There is so much more to know. There is so much more information to manage now than there was then. And so we were trying to confront the problems of cost and complexity, and in some ways, the things hadn't gotten better, but we said there is good news. 
The problem, of course, is that in theory, we have science, which turns into evidence, which turns into care. In practice, much of the science never gets synthesized or made into useful evidence, and depressingly, much of what we know should be done doesn't actually get done in the healthcare system. I should interject here, I am now talking about healthcare. I love David Katz's talk this morning. I believe we should change the farm bill and urban policy and food deserts, and we should eat less and exercise more. There's a lot to be done in the realm of promotion of public health, but I'm talking about healthcare. So we tried to think, what are the new tools that we have to address these problems? One is clearly computing power. We each of us carry around in our pockets computers stronger than the ones that first took men to the moon, and they're all connected to each other. Another is systems and process improvement insights. We now do Lean and Six Sigma, and we have, for the first time, applied modern management techniques to medicine, techniques that have been in place in retail for decades. We're just beginning to get it together. Another thing that we have, however, is a change in patient-clinician culture. Any of you who've ever seen um, Best Doctors or Yelp Reviews or any of the other ratings by which patients increasingly, with complete disregard to any scientific validity, by the way, are empowered and empowering others to rate their experiences with doctors, the kind of degradation of hierarchy that we see in lots of areas of society is happening in medicine as well. And of course, people have access to information, lay people have access to information that would have been completely inaccessible even a generation ago. And there are various policy levers for incentives and transparency and accountability and engagement. Let me stop for a minute on the word engagement. What many people in the health professions mean by patient engagement is they should do what I tell them to do. That is an engaged patient. We used to, the word, the, used the word, used, we used to use the word compliant. That's kind of politically incorrect, and so we've cleaned it up and say we want them to be engaged. I'd like to suggest to you there's a different kind of patient engagement that might radically transform our healthcare system and help us achieve the triple aim. So Tom Bodenheimer and I wrote an article several months ago saying, propose solutions to the physician shortage without training more physicians. And I'd like to submit to you that what we said about primary care is true about physician services in general. And if you take a minute and think about this wedge, how will we meet the unmet need for de and demand for physician services. Some of it will be with physicians. That's the lower blue portion of this wedge. Some of it will be with non-physician licensed practitioners, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, pharmacists, dentists, and other people who've been to school for 15 years, just different schools for 15 years, who can perform the things that physicians are doing now. We will have to add the power and use of non-licensed healthcare personnel, techs, assistants. At Virginia Mason, they call them flow managers. People who haven't been to school for 15 years, but they may have been in school for three or four or five. But importantly, we'll also have to add the labor and insights of patients themselves and of technology, that is to say, we will have to have non-professionals do what professionals do, and we'll have to have machines do what people do. And I submit to you that that's what we do in every other service industry in America, with results that are dramatic, both with regard to cost and convenience. So while we talk about how to make physician labor more efficient, I would remind you that Peter Drucker once said, there is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. In the last several years, banking has gone from this to this 
to this, to this. Anybody here fly to Rochester or to Minneapolis? Anybody, anybody here using a travel agent to do that? In the last several years, travel arrangements have gone from this to that. In the last several years, research has gone from this to this. And medical consultation has gone from that to that. <laughs> so my point, humorously expressed but seriously meant, is that the basic structure of our interaction with virtually every service industry has been transformed with enabling technology to allow lay people, I am a lay person as far as travel arrangements and research is concerned, to allow lay people to do successfully and safely things that we used to have to have trained professionals to do for us. And that revolution has only barely touched healthcare. And the reason it hasn't, frankly, although it is invoked in the name of safety, is largely in the name of the protection of the existing income streams and cultural predilections of people like us who are in the healthcare providing business. So now, several years ago, I used to point out that when I was in medical training, it took two days and lots of exams to diagnose strep throat, and now a high school graduate can do this in five minutes for three bucks. And someone said, well, that's easy to say for a simple test like that. And then a colleague pointed out that there are patients who are on anticoagulation who need to know if they will bleed to death, who have superior outcomes measuring their own anticoag factors at home compared to going into the COAG clinic run by people who've been to school for 15 years to check on their COAG levels. And then somebody said, oh, well, but that's for a test. You still need professionals to manage chronic disease. So two weeks ago, there was an article published in JAMA that's followed over 500 patients for two years in England and compared one group who had usual care for their hypertension managed by professionals and another group that not only took their blood pressure at home but titrated their own medications based on the results. Guess who came out better? And then a friend of mine said, yeah, but that's simple, it's hypertension. So my colleagues at the IHI pointed me to a dialysis clinic in Sweden, which if I can get my friend in the back to play the video, I'll show you some results from. Vid Länsjukhuset i HV Jönköping har det funnits en självdialysenhet sedan flera år. Men i våras invigdes en ny paviljong med 12 platser åtta fler än tidigare. Just nu är det 14 patienter och de nyttiga platserna enligt ett schema. Ibland kommer jag klockan sex och då öppnar jag med kort. Då är jag helt själv här för att personalen börjar inte från klockan sju. Och vi som har kort, det är vi som sköter oss helt själva. Paviljongen kommer till nu i april har vi inriktat och tidigare har vi försökt att få att dialysen ska utvidgas. Men så har det inte funnits pengar och resurser och då känner man nej, inte nu igen. Men nu när det här är klart så känns det som att det var rätt timing För det är nu vi har börjat eh, med tänka självdialys att de flesta ska kunna det. Innan var det nog att det hade blivit som en vanlig dialys och så har man kanske tagit ett hörn. Det första jag gör när jag kommer på morgonen är att jag startar maskinen så att den gör sitt självtest. Sen tar jag min vagn och går ut och hämtar mina grejer. Efter det så börjar jag klä maskinen. Så sätter jag dit slangar och filter och lite annat. 20 minuter för att bli färdigt allt sammans innan jag kan börja sticka nålarna. Jag sköter alla momenten från början till slut helt själv. Själva dialysen tar ju fyra timmar. När jag är kopplad i maskinen. Sen ska man koppla innan och man ska städa efteråt. Ja, 25 timmar i veckan ungefär. 
normalt så styr ju dialysen livet för du har måndag, onsdag, fredag kanske klockan och så är det det. Men vi skulle vilja att livet styr dialysen. Så att eh, om du behöver lämna barnen eller du behöver hämta dem eller du jobbar så ska du komma efter det För du måste ha dialys. Men du kan försöka få det att anpassas till dagen som du har det. Hemdialys är ju inget eh, alternativ för mig. För att jag bor i hyreslägenhet och eh, har lite utrymmesbrist. Jag är ju här fyra dagar i veckan och trivs jättebra här. Grant. So, is my point that all of our patients could do their own dialysis? No. But I tried to show you from strep throats to anticoagulation to chronic hypertension to dialysis, there is a huge gap between what we have patients doing and what they are capable of doing on their own. Oh, by the way, the self-dialysis unit has a lower infection rate and better outcomes than the unit run by the nephrologists. Surprise, surprise. So let's think about triple aim. Lower per capita costs, better health, improved patient experience. In each of those domains, it seems to me that we are leaving on the table. We are squandering a huge asset which is the knowledge, involvement, and enthusiasm of patients in their own care. And I'd suggest to you as a thing that you might think about when you go back to wherever you go, if you're a provider, um, forget engagement, it's kind of a loaded, jargony term, you might start with the question, what is it that we are doing for patients that with some education and tools, they might do for themselves? And if you're a patient, you might ask yourself the next time you interact with your provider, what is it that they are doing for me that I actually could do as well or better myself if I had some education and some empowering technology? You'll note the patient-run dialysis machine has little charts and graphs so they know where to put things, just like Orbitz has a little button that says push for the ticket here. So in every other service industry, we found that self-care, self-service, with empowering technology actually improves the things that we want to improve. And I submit to you that not all, but perhaps a healthier part of achieving the triple aim than you might think will be involved in uh, pursuing that same transformation in healthcare. I must say, in the interest of full disclosure, this slide, which I love, is from the website of the Florida Medical Association. I didn't get their permission, and I'm not sure they'd agree with the content of my talk, but it is a terrific slide. Thank you very much. Talk about taking risks. <laughs> Look out. The lawyers in the audience will be after you. Um, again, uh, I asked Kim this question. We talked a lot about culture and uh, Culture is both an enabler of innovation, but also a, 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 a obstacle to innovation if you don't take it into consideration in your strategy. How do you see that? Well, yeah, I think uh, the thing that has to be ignited, that has to be overcome here, is culture both on the part of providers and, frankly, patients right. about their expectations of roles. And um, for providers, it's both an economic and a cultural issue. If I'm a pediatrician and we funded a study that suggests that 80% of what the bread and butter activities of a pediatrician are in his or her office could actually be done by nurse practitioners or parents. So clearly there's an issue there. We still need pediatricians. We just don't need to pay them pediatricians pay to do parents' work. We need to pay them pediatricians pay to do pediatricians' work. For people, for patients, they also will need to come to a different expectation about what they do, but that's probably the case with me or you with regard to our banking or our traveling. The first time you used Orbitz, it was a little scary, and the second time you kind of got used to it, and now you're fairly comfortable with it. So I think although, that's... Although Orbitz and banking, and banking may be a better metaphor, although it's a dangerous metaphor, as uh, Jeff Clapp was saying the other day, um, you, know, you have episodic interactions with those. Part of what we're trying to get to here is to think of health as 
as something that's ongoing, as something that's yes. kind of 24 seven. And so that we're thinking about health and not just thinking about disease. We're thinking about preventive strategies and not just thinking about dysfunction, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So then the pediatrician becomes kind of a member of a team. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if the way that we do some of these innovations where somebody says, wow, a nurse practitioner could do this, or a patient could do this dialysis, then there's this complicated process where, all right, we try it out in the pilot, it maybe works, we get FDA approval, and you know, then we set up a situation where here's the self-patient, self-dialysis clinic in one city, and you know, maybe it's generalized, maybe it becomes a national phenomenon, maybe it doesn't, you, know, you hear about it, but there's no process for, for thinking about in the team of pediatricians, for instance, how we could farm out most of this activity to the parents. You know, my kids are taught, ooh, icky, needles. You know, there has to be somebody in a white coat to do the needles. But if there was a discussion about, now what would you like to do to make your health better, to maintain your health? What would, what would you like to do, patient, parent, nurse? And that that was a sort of a team discussion that happens from the beginning, then everything wouldn't be pilot programs. It wouldn't be uh, something that happens, you know, in some experimental setting. And that we are encouraged to farm out uh, uh, activity and capability to patients and to other people besides doctors. Well, you're raising two points. One point is I completely agree patients have very different aptitudes and interests. And one of the perils of this is that we would flip our one-size-fits-all where we do everything to a one-size-fits-all where you do everything. That's not appropriate. So for any of this, it has to be scaled to people's abilities. But the second problem you're raising is a different one. Part of the reason we have such difficulty disseminating new developments is precisely the maze of state-based regulation about who gets to do what. So for instance, in one state you can get a whooping cough vaccination in a drugstore, in another state you can't because the medical board of Maine has decided differently from the medical board of Vermont based not on science, frankly, but politics and lobbying. In the state of California, if you're a paramedic, you're licensed to stick a tube down my trachea and save my life, but if you take my blood pressure at a community health fair, that's against the scope of practice and you could be prosecuted. So we have this maze of state-based ideas, not based on science, of who gets to do what. And one of the principal obstacles to rapid dissemination of improvements here is that even if you had a pilot program that proved it worked in Missouri, the medical board in Kansas can say it's illegal in Kansas. And that's one of the things that we have to confront about transforming the culture of this hierarchical professional definition of who gets to do what based on how many years of school they had as opposed to what they might safely do with current technology. You know, that strikes me as something we don't want to change incrementally. We don't want to pull, if we start pulling down one regulation at a time or one state at a time, we'll be doing this for the next 150 years. Is there a way to blow the whole thing up? I understand why the FDA is involved in, you know, uh, uh, regulating statins, okay. Mm -hmm. I understand why the FDA is involved in regulating uh, hip replacements, mm -hmm. but I don't understand why the FDA has to be involved or a state medical board has to be involved if I take my own stitches out. You well, know, but if, if they find out that I did that, somebody could get in trouble. But I just do it on my own because I, I don't want to do a, 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 a doctor visit. I've, I've asked state officials that, and I'll tell you without attribution if you are the chair of the health committee of the Minnesota State Senate, you are in line for campaign contributions mm. from doctors and nurses and EMTs and paramedics, dentists, dental technicians. You're in fact in line for contributions of all the warring people because that's the source of your power. So I agree with you, and I've suggested without much um, uh, impact, frankly, that there might be some federal effort to kind of create waivers or safe zones. Let's talk about your example of the FDA. The FDA says statins are safe. They don't say statins are safe in Iowa, but not in Illinois. If they're safe, they're safe. If it's safe for a nurse with certain kind of training to do uh, colonoscopy, it's safe in Missouri and Minnesota. And yet, we've had this legacy of control of who does what. 
which is really the core of what I'm talking about, that's still very much in rather parochial state hands. And if you, uh, given your understanding of politics, have a suggestion on how to get through that roadblock, right. I'd be awfully grateful. Now, that's a week-long series of my <laughs> program. All right, two questions. One's silly, um, but I have a feeling you have a good answer for it. And uh, the other, actually quite practical. Um, uh, can you envision in this selfie culture of ours selfie colonoscopies? Um, probably not, but I could imagine selfie uh, colon MRIs. I can imagine selfie mammograms. I've never had a mammogram, but I'm told anyone who's giving mammograms ought to have one to understand how uncomfortable they are. Um, all I can say is I know this seems insane, but when you and I were going to high school and college, you had to go to a doctor to find out if you were pregnant. You had to go to a doctor to get Advil. You had to go to a doctor to get Benadryl because it wasn't safe otherwise. And so I suspect that 20 years ago, the travel agent said no one will ever buy a plane ticket in their pajamas. They'll wind up in Kathmandu instead of Cleveland. That's just not safe for anybody to do. So part of the reason I use these other examples is we do stuff that would have been unthinkable 20 years ago because we're taught and we're given some tools and it turns out to maybe not be quite as dangerous as we thought it would. We've got to enable that empowerment. We've got to enable that expertise so that we can develop teams with healthcare and not have everybody hiding behind the re regulations and, and you know, keeping the relationship from happening. And having patients essentially dependent on us. That's the nature of the relationship. Right, well I knew you'd have an answer for that, that's for sure. All right, final question, you're an MD, right? I am. And you see that I'm a spinal cord injured paraplegic. Yeah. So you know a couple of things about me. Yeah. What? What do you know about me? I know that you probably need assistance in mobility, that you need access to a built environment that allows you to not have to uh, uh, walk upstairs. Uh, I don't know right. if this is... If what about, what about uh, some maybe subtler things about how my physiology works that I probably need that you could speculate about, knowing that I'm a paraplegic from T4 down. So you might need help with bowel, bowel and right. bladder functions, okay. you might not. Uh, past that, I would hesitate to guess. Uh, what about uh, urination? Don't, don't know, probably, you probably need catheterization. Uh, that's right, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. So, so uh, let's say uh, that, uh, and I have to catheterize about every what, do you think? As an MD? I don't know. Four hours, right? Okay. Yeah, about four hours, something like that. I mean, you know, we have to go every yeah. four hours. Now, uh, I'm, I'm among doctors, so we can have this conversation. Um, the, uh, a couple of months ago, I was flying from uh, Minnesota to uh, New York, and I stupidly, uh, because I had a sort of a over-organization impulse, I packed my catheter that I normally have with me all the time in checked baggage. Mm. Checked into the airport. We had a six-hour wait for the flight because there was weather in New York, and I realized that my catheter is in, in uh, checked baggage. Mm -hmm. Are there any options for me at that point? What do you think my options are? I don't know, depending on which airport you were coming from, there might have been a medical supply store somewhere within reach of the airport. Somebody might have been able to go to a supply store and buy a catheter. Um, you might have had a family member who could bring one, or uh, you might have had a pharmacist if you had an ongoing relationship with a pharmacist or health plan. You'd have to have an ongoing relationship with a yeah. pharmacist, because otherwise you'd need a prescription yes. to get a catheter yes. if you're a paraplegic. Yes. So even though you're going in and saying, I gotta really go, and the pharmacist understands completely. That pharmacist actually can't give you a catheter yeah. unless you have a prescription. Yeah. So you're out of luck. Well, apparently someone somewhere was af afraid that you might abuse the catheter. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's a, catheter abuse, a serious it's, problem. It's a serious problem. It's an epidemic. Yeah. There's it an is. epidemic yeah. of yeah. catheter abuse. So what do you think I did? <laughs> I, You'll never guess. I know. Yeah. I was rolling through. I mean, I was actually terrified. My kids were with me, and I'm going, oh, my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I rolled through the airport, and I saw another person in a wheelchair, uh. Uh, a quadriplegic, high quad, so I know that they have the same kind of injury as I do and probably need the same kind of catheter. Yep. I rolled up to this guy. It's probably the first time in human history it's ever happened, and I said, hey, dude, I have a weird question. He looks at me and he says, 
um, shoot. I said, do you have a size 14 straight catheter, an extra one that I could use? I put mine in check bag. And she goes, sure. Yeah. Opened his bag, handed it to me. Crisis over. Yeah. Empower patients. Right. So I think you've just given some developer out here an idea for a new app. Yeah. Right? If we've got a catheter apps that locator. Can, that's right. If you can, there we go. Uh, well, not catheter, but maybe medical device locator. Yeah. Somebody might need a colonoscopy bag. Somebody might have a colonoscopy bag. You know? Yeah. Empower patients. Mark, thanks so much. My pleasure. Great talking to you. Yeah.